Good morning, everybody. I'm really pleased to see that we have an almost full house, so uh, that's really good. I think we're all here to celebrate, uh, well, 40 years of existence for the Erasmus School of Health Policy uh, and Management. Uh, I think it's really a, a nice occasion. It's a beautiful day. We had a few bad days of bad weather, uh, but luckily today I think it all cleared up because we have this special event. Um, well, uh, I will keep it short. Uh, people who know me uh, know that I'm good at keeping it short. Um, but I, I want to say that I'm really proud uh, to be part of ESHPM. I'm also happy. Uh, I think we have uh, a lot to be proud of, 40 years of doing research in the field of healthcare, uh, trying to make an impact. Uh, so I think the theme we have chosen for today, making healthcare sustainable, I think it's really, uh, it's really timely. Uh, the last two years were uh, quite hectic years. Uh, we had the COVID crisis. So we have a lot of interesting workshops today. We have uh, one related to equity, we have one related to financial sustainability, and one related to resilience. More importantly, we also have two plenary speakers, uh, and that is Mike Drummond and that is Trish Greenolch, uh, and I think they both will have thought-provoking uh, lectures, and uh, there, will, there will be room for discussion, so please pay attention because there will be some thought-provoking statements made today. Uh, I'm also very pleased uh, that we have the rector, uh, Annalien, uh, in, our, in our midst, uh, and she will say uh, a few words before we give the floor to Trish. So, Annalien, welcome. Thank you, Peter. Um, so I would like to welcome all of you here at the Erasmus Pavilion. And I'm, I feel honored to be here to celebrate the 40th anniversary of EHHPM. And um, I just said to, to some colleagues, I really feel at home here if I wouldn't have been, I'm a rector and appointed a, a professor ethics of biotechnologies at the Erasmus School of philosophy, but if I wouldn't have been appointed there, I think I would have been uh, pretty much at home at your school. So I'm really glad to be here today and I try to stay uh, at least uh, a bit in the morning. Uh, I would also like to dedicate a special welcome to Professor Trish uh, Greenhold from the University of Oxford and Professor Mike uh, Drummond. I'm, I don't know where he is sitting. Ah, oh, over there, uh, coming from the University of York. Um, who have both received honorary doctorates from uh, Erasmus University. Uh, and Trish Greenhall actually was uh, uh, an honorary doctorate uh, this November at my first DS. Unfortunately, it was mostly uh, digital. So glad to have you physically uh, here. Well, anniversaries are a great occasion to, to strengthen the ties with each other and to pause and to reflect on what is achieved in the recent years, but also a bit further on and actually you became 40 um, and actually we're from the same generation um, actually I'm two years older than than the school um, and so that's and I know from my personal experience that's also an age where you reflect on what you have been doing this this for uh, first 40 years of your life um, the Erasmus School of Health Policy and Management has been conducting research how to keep healthcare affordable and accessible for everyone. It's a matter of great pride to see that the faculty has grown into a national and international leading faculty in terms of education, research, but certainly also impact. The faculty contributes to high quality, accessible and affordable, efficient, and I also think uh, sustainable healthcare around the world. And it plays a key role also in the Convergence Alliance, and that is the ecosystem that we're building uh, with Erasmus University, Erasmus Medical Center, and the Technical University uh, of Delft. Um, and, well, actually, there are many growing partnerships, uh, particularly in research, but we're also heading towards educational uh, uh, collaborations in, in this uh, Convergence Alliance. And because te uh, technology and data in healthcare, enormous progress has been made in both preventive and curative areas. 
and the faculty has tremendous expertise that is essential to the challenges in health and welfare, and it has acquired a leading position in the healthcare sciences. I think everyone in, in the healthcare field, at least in the Netherlands, knows uh, uh, the school and is aware of the activities that has been conducting. And I can also say this from my, um, one day in the week I'm, I'm in The Hague, and also there people from the ministry and into politics know what is happening actually at, at this school. So I would like to thank all of you for, for, for doing this and, and working on, on impact and, and uh, to your great dedication and commitment and also the visibility of, of the school. And for those who might wonder what the ER strategy of making positive societal impact represents, because that is actually our, our strategy and, and slogan, I would like to point to the numerous excellent examples from the work of this faculty. So I think you're, you're a great illustration of what we envisage as Erasmus University. So today will be a day of, full of various interactive sessions on, uh, as I saw in the programme, value-based healthcare, uh, sustainability, health inequalities and the resilience of healthcare systems. And I wish you a great day, many years to come, and let's enjoy and celebrate the next 40 years. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, thank you, Annalene, for these kind words. Well, I think now it's time for our first plenary speaker. Please give a warm hand for Trish Greenholz. Well, thanks very much indeed. And I'm going to talk today about crisis policy making. Uh, and I'm going to introduce you to some ideas from pragmatist philosophy. It's an interesting word, pragmatism, because everybody talks about being pragmatic. I've already talked to someone in the audience about a colleague. There's, oh, he's a very pragmatic guy. Um, but actually, there's a whole philosophy of pragmatism, which I think will link to the agenda that you've got today around sustainability of healthcare, but also with, with the message I want to put to, across today, which is that I think we, we need, if we're going to face the future, we need to do research differently. And that's what this talk is all about. Um, and I'm going to use the pandemic and policy making in the pandemic crisis as a worked example to build up to some more general things that I want to say about, about pragmatist research in, in the philosophical sense. Um, so thanks to my funders, uh, to my research team, to my collaborators um, at the University of Oxford, and also uh, in a lot of other places, particularly Cheryl Missack from the University of Toronto, who's a professor of pragmatist philosophy, who's been based in Oxford in the last few months, and we've been working together. Um, I'll just play with the technology. OK, so let's think about the pandemic. and. We all know that conventional medical science, evidence-based medicine, randomized controlled trials, all that space brought us some very impressive early wins in the pandemic. Uh, repurposing of old drugs like dexamethasone, development of new drugs, monoclonals, antivirals, all sorts of things, and of course the vaccines. Um, without any doubt, conventional approaches to, to biomedical sciences saved a lot of lives and helped hugely in the pandemic. And I should say, uh, I speak as someone who owes my life to randomized controlled trials. I'm a survivor of a poor prognosis cancer for which randomized controlled trials uh, demonstrated the efficacy of particular drugs and surgical interventions. Uh, and, and I had those many years ago, so I'm not an enemy of the randomized controlled trial by any means. But the RCT, the experimental approach to research, didn't answer, or at least didn't definitively answer, some of the pandemic's most pressing and contested questions. The question of what kind of personal protective equipment should be worn by who, in what circumstances, both healthcare workers, other frontline workers, 
the lay public? Who should be wearing what kind of mask, for example? The question of our children, should we close schools? Should we get kids learning remotely? And all those issues around the inequalities of closed schools, but also schools as centers of transmission of the virus. Uh, and the question of physical distancing, social distancing. Um, these are just some of the questions in the pandemic. Have you noticed that as we've gone on, we're now into year three of this pandemic, these questions are getting more contested uh, in, in some senses. People are becoming polarized and science is not giving us the answers. This idea that we were going to get certainty um, doesn't appear to be uh, doesn't appear to be uh, bearing out. So let me take you back to a book that was written. I think these are Dutch people, actually. They, they wrote this book before the pandemic. And it's really interesting how they predicted so many things that were going to become problematic in the pandemic. So they're talking about the politics of crisis management, any crisis, um, an ecological crisis, a war, um, or whatever. Um, they do talk a little bit about uh, public health crises, and they say any kind of crisis is associated with three things, a big threat, a major threat to life and limb, uncertainty, and urgency. And they say that in times of crisis, there are five leadership tasks. The first is to make sense of, of what's happening using real-time data, what's going on. Um, the second task, decision-making and coordinating those decisions. Thirdly, telling a story, constructing a meaningful account of what is happening. I don't know about what happened in the Netherlands. In the UK, the politicians went on the television every evening at 5 p.m. and said, this is what's happening. Um, fourthly, as the crisis develops, managing accountability, um, being honest about the mistakes you made, perhaps. And fifth, learning from the crisis, preparing for the next crisis. So, so these were five leadership tasks. And I'm going to come back to that slide towards the end of my talk. Uh, one of the things this book talks about is the notion of tragic choices. In a crisis, policymakers need to make tragic choices. Nobody wanted to close schools. Nobody wanted to close borders. Nobody wanted to lock down the entire society. Um, but these things had to happen, or, or arguably had to happen, in order to protect us because it was a crisis. Now, in the UK, um, pandemic policy making was pretty problematic. And, and there would be people, many people from the UK in the audience, I know, uh, people might disagree with this, but, but there are now analyses and public inquiries uh, beginning. Uh, some things have been published, and even the government's own analysis of what happened in the early months of the pandemic, uh, to some extent, is acknowledging that in the UK, pandemic policy making was characterized by poor decisions, ineffective interventions, interventions that perhaps too little, too late, waste of resources, huge amounts of money spent on things that didn't help, bitter squabbles, erosion of trust uh, in many, uh, many levels in, across many sectors, and of course, widespread loss of life. The UK had one of the highest mortality rates in the pandemic, despite coming almost top, very close to the top, certainly in the top three in the index of uh, health services resilience, pandemic preparedness that was developed in 2019. So we, we were predicted to do well, we actually did very badly. So what was all this about? Well, I want to talk a little bit about two different framings of what policy making is. And this is, I'm slightly kind of developing ideal types, but uh, there is a view of policy making that says it's about following the science. It's basically decision science. It's seen as rational decision making. 
It's mostly about gathering quantitative data, putting it into the top, turning the handle, uh, weighing up all the alternatives, and out at the bottom will come a recommendation that this is what works, this is what you should do, and then you put that into practice. There is, in this model of policy making, a major emphasis on randomized controlled trials and other controlled experimental designs that will tell you, in a kind of abstracted way, what works what works. And then there is another framing of policy making which, which looks at policy making in a completely different way. It says policy making really is a rhetorical thing. It's argument. It's about narrativizing. It's about framing. It's about negotiating between ideas. It's above all about persuading one's colleagues that this is the, these are the important questions. These are the key ideas. Um, and perhaps it's also about enacted drama. Policy making, according to Deborah Stone and others who write in, in this uh, genre, is a contact sport between three things, ideas, institutions, and interests. Uh, and the ideas dimension of policy making is particularly key because we, the, the, the policy, um, the ideas are not self-evident. The, the problems are not self-evident. We have to argue this is a key thing that we need to solve. Hayer and Wagner uh, published this book, again, just before the pandemic, and it's very, very salient to what actually happened in the pandemic, that the new policy environment uh, is characterised uh, by many dimensions of complexity, new sites of policy making, policies getting made in all sorts of different spaces now, cultural pluralism, interconnectedness and interdependence between sectors. Actually, uh, we were just hearing about, the, you know, your academics now spend a day a week sitting with policy makers, you know, all that kind of thing, interdigitation, inreach and outreach uh, between the higher education sector, between the policy sector, with industry, the third sector, all that kind of thing. Uh, we're also in a period of time characterized by radical uncertainty, limits to knowledge, uh, erosion of trust in policymakers. This was something that was happening before the pandemic. And also, of course, radical transformations of the digital world uh, with social media uh, and all sorts of influences on us every time we open our laptops, uh, some of which we're aware of and some of which aren't. So this was the new policy environment uh, that Hire and Wagner were describing in, I think, about 2019, 2018. Now, Wagner got together with uh, Barbara Prainsack and wrote this book about the pandemic within, which is taking these ideas forward and applying them to what happened in, particularly in the first year of the pandemic. And what they say in this book is that following the science, that first framing of policy making that, that I presented, what it meant uh, for some governments was amassing and then following a very particular kind, a narrow kind of scientific evidence in which, they say, structural inequalities were largely ignored. And they make a case in this book for this huge gap in pandemic policymaking right across a number of countries where the need for universal basic services was ignored. We all know that the pandemic was characterized by massive inequalities of people who were poor, living in uh, unsuitable housing, multi-generational groups living in, in small flats, for example, um, people working in the gig economy, people who couldn't take time off work without losing income, all those kind of things. And they couldn't simply isolate um, uh, in the way that perhaps, you know, I sat at home and worked in my nice, comfortable study in, in my, uh, you know, nice, comfortable house. Uh, now, those were recognized, uh, certainly recognized at an academic level. We did a lot of analysis of them. But at policy level, they were not center stage in the same way that, for example, the drugs and vaccines were. Let me talk a little bit about uncertainty. The, if you look back at the last two and a quarter years, uh, there were so many aspects of the pandemic that were uncertain. But... 
the scientists and the policymakers were pursuing certainty. They wanted to find the answer and then put it into practice. Uh, there was a lot of talk about evidence-based pandemic policy making. Not only that, um, but I want to talk about a particular kind of uncertainty. Uncertainty is laid bare in times of crisis. We all know crisis is characterized by uncertainty, but, but there's a particular kind of uncertainty. It's unknown unknowns. And let me explain what I mean by that. A known unknown is uh, something you can frame as one of those PICO questions, population intervention comparison outcome. Uh, so for example, what is the impact of dexamethasone on survival in uh, patients who are requiring supplemental oxygen in their hospital beds. So that's, that's an, a known unknown. You can then do a randomized controlled trial and you can find that dexamethasone reduces mortality by 30% in that subpopulation. An unknown unknown is when you don't even know what the question is. Hang on, we don't know. We, 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 you said something about schools. What was the question? What exactly is the uncertainty there? Uh, what, what, what is the thing that science has got to answer? And of course, that's, that's harder. That's much harder. And it was these unknown unknowns uh, that made the pandemic so problematic, both philosophically and practically. Um, the unknown unknowns and the weak response of government to that led to a huge erosion of trust in the UK and actually in other countries too, but this is the example I know best. Um, we had the development of this alternative advisory group. So the Scientific Advisory Group on Emergencies uh, was advising the government, but an, an alternative group called Independent SAGE established themselves. I should actually declare a conflict of interest now. I've just joined Independent Sage because I believe we still need uh, an independent voice. Having said that, I think Sage in the UK did, did a pretty good job. And there are some members of Sage who are also on Independent Sage, but that's another, that's another issue. Uh, but lots of kind of marches and protests and uh, trouble for the government. Okay, so let me summarize where I've got to so far. Uh, in the UK, the government and public health authorities made a number of mistakes, I think. They failed to grasp the essential nature of crisis, inherent uncertainty, the need to make urgent decisions to avert a major threat, urgent decisions in, uh, in, at times of uncertainty. They approached policymaking as a logical endeavour, which was grounded in scientific rationality, they, they thought, and that favoured a very narrow kind of evidence. They assumed that uncertainty was temporary and would be eliminated by science. That is, they would get certainty first and then they would act. They conflated knowledge with these abstracted, decontextualized, and, and usually quantitative bits of information, of which the classic example in the pandemic is the R value, um, or the effect size of intervention. So they chased these, and, and, and time and again in, in, in the literature, both the lay press and scientific press, what is the R value? What is the R value? Um, and is it changing? All that kind of thing. As if finding out the R value was going to take you somewhere uh, that was going to help. Um, and of course, it, you know, to some extent it was, but you get what I'm saying. Uh, and they communicated with the public chiefly via declarations of false certainty. We know this um, because they felt that the public would have more confidence in government if uh, they pretended they, they were more certain than they actually were. Now, let's go back to just over two years ago. Um, when I began to part company with an academic colleague, Carl Hennigan. Now, my paper's on the left, and, and his website there is on the right. He's never published in peer-reviewed journals on this. Um, so I, at the beginning of March, actually, wrote a paper along with some colleagues. You can see their names there, saying it's about time we had face masks. This is when nobody was wearing masks except in the Asian countries where they were all wearing masks. And we argued for the precautionary principle. And we said in the paper, we don't know whether masks work. In fact, there is, we've looked at the evidence, we've looked at these RCTs in previous epidemics and pandemics. We don't know if they work, but it looks like they might. So let's wear them just in case. And Carl published uh, a website who, and, and this was based on the findings of a Cochrane review. 
Um, there's 14 randomized controlled trials and I can't read it, what they say, yeah, no effect in either healthcare workers or community settings. They say, well, there isn't any evidence. Um, and the British Medical Journal soon after um, ran a piece about two camps. Actually, this is on about uh, shielding and blanket policy, so it's slightly different. But, but very quickly, both the academic press and the lay press started to do this both sides journalism. Scientists don't know what they're talking about because one lot are saying this and the other lot are saying that. And I then spent um, a year and a half going on television and always there was somebody arguing the opposite and, and, and the interviewer was trying to polarise us. So, uh, but, but right at the beginning, um, I was saying, wait a minute, even though we're uncertain, we need to act. So here's a summary of that little that impasse. On the one hand, if you take a conventional evidence-based medicine view, uh, the little, that pyramid of evidence, so many of you will be familiar with this, with the randomized controlled trial at the top because it's more robust and it's less biased and all those kind of arguments. Um, and you have anecdotes at the bottom and then those sort of different methodological approaches in the middle. If you accept that triangle, if you value randomized trials over other kinds of evidence, they seem to support the narrative that masks don't work, or at least they strongly support the narrative that we've got no evidence that masks do work. On the other hand, if you uh, reject the hierarchy of evidence and say, no, we need to look at lots of different kinds of evidence, and we need to take those together, we need to evaluate each kind of evidence within its genre, we have lots of evidence that masks do work. So here was the impasse that I've now spent two years uh, arguing about, publishing about. Let's just unpack the, the arguments that some colleagues and I actually uh, published in The Lancet um, called 10 Scientific Reasons Why We Know COVID is Airborne. Um, multiple kinds of evidence, all taken together, not a single one of these pieces of evidence stands alone, uh, but if we take them all together, we're looking at an airborne mechanism of spread. This is something the WHO denied right at the beginning, but we were building the case. The first kind of evidence was animal studies using air ducts. You get two cages of ferrets, uh, and you connect them with right-angled bends, so droplets don't go around right-angled bends, and the only air that gets connected is, is connected between them. Um, and you have one ferrets who've got COVID, and the other ferrets haven't got COVID, and all the ferrets in the second cage catch COVID. That's pretty good evidence that something's traveling in the air. Now, the EBM people would say, oh, no, it's an animal study. We all know we can't take animal studies. Wait a minute. We're not talking about a randomized controlled trial of a drug in animals. We're talking about mechanistic evidence. Explain the ferret study without the virus traveling through the air. No, we're not looking at animal studies. It's not in that red triangle at the top of our hierarchy of evidence. Similarly, sneeze studies. As people, I, I, I published a paper with Lydia Borowiba, who's for years has done almost nothing apart from um, get people to sneeze in a laboratory and take photos, take these kind of video photos of where the sneeze drops go. And in a way, it's kind of weird, but hey, someone's got to study sneezing. And she was the world expert on, on the aerodynamics of sneezing. But again, the EBM people are saying, that doesn't look like science. You know, it looks, it's interesting whenever people laugh, because laughter is data. Laughter takes you into a space where the people hearing this think it's absurd. And actually that was why the sneeze studies, which were published in Nature and Science and the New England, of, England Journal of Medicine, it's, this is high science, but they weren't taken seriously. They were considered absurd. Then there were cases of super spreader events. Now, I think it was the St. Matthew Passion in one of the concert halls in Amsterdam on the 8th of March in 2020, where 130 people became infected with SARS-CoV-2, am I right? Many ended up in hospital, I think four died. So, so you know, in the Netherlands, you had one of the most famous super spreading events. Now, the EBM people would say, oh, and there's anecdote. It wasn't controlled. 
It wasn't controlled. He didn't randomize anybody, but you, wait a minute, wait a minute. There was a choir sang in an indoor space and 130 people got COVID. Oh, they may not have caught it from that. And so we get round and round and round that we, this wasn't a proper experiment. But if you create a database, as some people did, of lots and lots of super spreading events around the world, one of the things that came out was shouting and singing indoors. And I, I feel really sorry for people. I got, you know, PhD student was an opera singer. But sorry, singing was this big deal. Well, singing generates aerosols. Okay. Then there was quarantine cases. These were really interesting. Quarantine hotels, people who shared the corridor air but never touched a common surface because there was CCTV. They developed COVID from one another. It was the same genetic variant. How do you explain that without saying it was airborne spread? And they said, oh, no, they must have touched the same bin lid or something. No, no, they didn't. And so on. Engineering evidence. This is, we're just doing a paper on this, actually, that, that some of you are engineers. You'll know this. The hierarchy of evidence for engineering is completely different. One of the things that happens in engineering is that you enshrine your evidence base in standards, in particular standards of the quality of materials or the way they're put together. And you can see them stamped on the outside of those respirator masks. Uh, but engineering standards don't have any currency in EBM's world. And so they don't, uh, you know, we know that those masks stop 99% of particles of a particular size because it's stamped on the outside that that's been shown. Uh, but that doesn't count because it's not a randomized controlled trial. All very interesting. And then there's cultural evidence of the human meaning making around masks. For some cultural groups, masks symbolize tyranny. For others, they symbolize security and solidarity and so on. Okay, so lots and lots of different kinds of evidence taken together. And you put all those together and make a nice big story about it. I just want to tell you about one other paper around masks. This is just fascinating mixed method imaginative, creative research by uh, a, a postdoctoral um, researcher uh, from the States. She's had a lot of grief uh, thrown at her on social media, but what she did was she looked at libertarian data visualizers. These are people, the keyboard warriors. They're usually not working in established university positions because they don't like authorities and they don't like institutions. They're the ones who say, do your own research. Um, they're very skilled at data visualization. They, they're, they're intelligent people, uh, and they're very good at making those graphs and charts. Um, they engage very critically with the official graphs, and they're the ones that challenge the number of deaths or, or whatever it might be. And then they do their own research. They generate their own visualizations, and they start circulating on social media, and you look at them and you think, oh, that's interesting. Um, and because you don't have the same kind of quantitative backgrounds then you think well where, where, where have they gone wrong because they, it doesn't look right to me but but yeah, and this is why uh, so much uh, of the social media evidence around masking shows no they don't work and uh, because of, because of this kind of stuff now if you um if you take this as another big chunk of um the stuff that's going on you have to actually unpack it and critique it and address it uh, on its own terms. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about that because I've got a whole lecture on that. But, but this, is, this is the kind of complexity that is, that is now entering into uh, research on masking and airborne transmission. OK, now let's just look at two paradigms. Um, and I'm going to get to the kind of denouement of this talk. You will mostly be familiar with the EBM paradigm where you're looking for a particular scientific truth like the R number. The goal of research is to establish that truth. Causality is linear. We give the drug, it prevents the disease or, or it cures the disease or whatever. The format of the research question, what is the effect size? Uh, good research is defined hierarchically by method. If it's RCT, it's good. Um, the goal of theorizing is simplification and abstraction. This works, this doesn't work. Um, and the ethical assumptions are broadly utilitarian. I want to take you into the complex systems paradigm where truth may be multiple. And I think that's what I've been trying to demonstrate with the masks and the airborne spread example. 
that the goal of research isn't actually to, to nail a particular truth. It's to surface and explore tensions and patterns. Causality is much more emergent. Um, and I think that example of the data visualization people uh, making trouble on social media is quite a good example of that. You, you have to sort of trace the narrative of what's going on. Um, the format of the research question this is quite important, is what is the contribution of this particular action or event or phenomenon or, or artifact uh, to what you're, what you're measuring? And what that means is you may not get a statistically significant finding when you isolate out uh, one dimension of it. Good research is based on multiple methods, which are combined narratively, as I hope I've demonstrated to you uh, with the mask example. And the theorizing is conjunctive, not disjunctive. In other words, we draw different parts together to depict the whole. Uh, and finally, ethics is more deliberative. We deliberate among multiple actors, all of whom have different values and goals. And as we do that, uh, the ethical issues become salient and we work through them. So it's, we don't just uh, do a sort of qualies uh, analysis. So here's where I discover pragmatism, um, and particularly the work of Professor Misak, who, who I have acknowledged at the beginning of the talk. She's written lots of books about pragmatist philosophy. So what's it all about? In relation to crisis policymaking, I think there are five key principles. And I introduced these briefly in a little talk yesterday. The first is that, that science is fallible, that proof is always going to elude us, or mostly going to elude us. We need to accept, and this is a philosophical point, that theory is always going to be underdetermined by data. Therefore, we need to reason abductively. We need to imagine, uh, and we need to think creatively in the absence of certainty. Secondly, that ideas and actions are inseparable. The pragmatists say an idea is something on which you are prepared to act. So go back to two and a bit years when I was writing my first of many papers on masking, I was absolutely sure that we needed to act even though we didn't have certainty. Uh, and that was because I'd weighed up the consequences of not acting, if this is the case, the consequences are going to be catastrophic. 40,000 deaths occurred in the UK between the 2nd of April 2020, when uh, our mask paper was uh, published, to the 9th of July 2020, when the mask mandate was introduced. And two weeks after that, the curve started to flatten. Thirdly, we need to look at problems in multiple ways. This is a fundamental tenet of pragmatism. We need to bring lots of different kinds of evidence and ideas and perspectives to the table and hammer those out. Now, you say, well, wait a minute. What about the flat earthers? What about people whose methods are really flaky? You want them around the table? Yes, we want the flat earthers presenting their evidence and trying to argue it out because they will soon be argued down by everybody else. What we don't want is to say only your evidence comes to the table. So the, so the pragmatist approach says, here's a complex problem, bring it all, argue it through, and the good stuff will, will stick and the rest will fall. Fourthly, uh, what some people call symbolic interactionism. Humans create shared symbolic meanings. Therefore, how people frame the issues matters as much as hard facts. And I guess the best example here is the vaccines. The hard facts are that this vaccine protects you this much, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but actually, some people don't view vaccines like that. They, they view vaccines as invented by Bill Gates to inject something into you and all the rest of it. And vaccine hesitancy now is a massive problem, especially in some low-income countries. Uh, and actually, unless we address the symbolic meanings of vaccinations, of masking, whatever it might be, uh, we're not going to control this pandemic. We'll, we'll still be here in 10 years' time. 
Uh, and finally, the, the fifth tenet of pragmatism I want to raise is this idea of building solutions with rather than for communities, participatory democracy. I think one of the big problems with the UK crisis policy making was that there was this inside track of particular advisors. Uh, and those particular advisors were very keen on RCTs and they were not keen on the pluralist, diverse uh, evidence base that I've been presenting to you this morning. Lots of research methodologies have pragmatist roots. Many of you are doing research uh, in one of, of these fields, possibly more. Um, particularly action research, I think, is, it, it draws very, very closely on, on pragmatist roots. Interestingly, the pragmatic randomized controlled trial, I don't think they should be using the word pragmatic because I don't think it's properly pragmatist. But some people have argued that it is, and I'm not going to get into that argument here. So let's come back to um, this book, um, Politics of Crisis Management, and these five leadership tasks uh, in the pandemic. So looking, I don't know whether we should look to the next pandemic. I think we should actually try and sort out this pandemic, because uh, it could get the longest pandemic in the, in the world was about 60 years. So we haven't, we're not through this yet. Um, here's how I think we can, um, or should, uh, shift the research agenda around crisis policy making. Firstly, I think we need to move from waiting for certain truths, throwing money, do a trial, blah, 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 to how do we make science-informed judgments in uncertain times? Secondly, I think we need to do research on how we move from a knowledge then action approach to acting under uncertainty. How do we apply the precautionary principle in a sensible um, and appropriate way in times of crisis? Actually, actually the um, European Commission produced a really good uh, paper on the precautionary principle a few years ago. Um, and that we need to dig that out and kind of improve it and, and sharpen it up. Here's a, a really important research question. How do we move from the rigid hierarchy of evidence to epistemological pluralism. The grant giving bodies, certainly in the UK, the journals, um, I've had many papers rejected from the Lancet because they weren't a randomized controlled trial, that kind of thing. How do we shift that power balance? Actually, I'm, I'm negotiating with a journal called BMJ Evidence-Based Medicine to publish a, a, a series of five articles that we're preparing at the moment on different kinds of evidence in different disciplines. We've got one about engineering evidence, we've got another one about case study evidence, et cetera. So we're trying to kind of move into EBM's turf uh, and influence the thinking of the editorial um, people. They may reject those, but I hope they don't. Um, how do we move from polarized camps to uh, what Schoen and Ryan have called frame reflective deliberation. In other words, understanding where the other side is coming from, even if you don't agree with them. I, I wrote a piece um, for the conversation with Dominic Wilkinson, who I profoundly disagree with, but we were set up as two um, polls uh, of a, in order to sort of entertain readers. Uh, and we weren't told that that was what was going to happen. And so we got together afterwards and said, wait a minute, let, what can we learn from each other? Um, and, and that was, it was a very useful thing to do, even though I still don't agree with him. Um, and finally, how can we move government decision-making from inside track influence, this narrow group of influencers, to participatory democracy? How, how can we have a, a more participatory uh, approach? So I am very keen on that as the research agenda for the next few years. Here's some, some pragmatist research questions. How can policy bodies move beyond a scientistic approach in which they commission advice on what works and then follow it? What structures, systems, and tools could help policymakers move from linear models to a knowledge through action approach? What could give them the confidence to do that? How can the distorting influence of evidence hierarchies and technocratic approaches to assessing evidence be overcome? How can frame awareness be applied to increase mutual understanding, reduce polarization as people's values and ideologies are brought to bear? And finally, how can we ensure that deliberations on urgent policy decisions 
go beyond a narrow group of favoured advisors. So, we now have time for questions and comments. Please feel free to disagree, challenge. I'm quite comfortable with you doing that. Um, I hope that was helpful. And because I've got the lights in my eyes, you may have to help me see who's asking question. Yes, there is somebody. Could you also please state your, shortly your name and where you're from? Well, <coughs> thanks a lot, Trace. Uh, my name is uh, Gaston Remmers. I'm the founder of pa uh, Foundation My Data Our Health. Uh, I'm a patient advocate, and I'm so happy that you bring this uh, stuff together. Um, as you know, crisis for patients, I'm a cancer survivor as you are, uh, is a constant thing. So we are experienced as crisis uh, facers, so to say. So our ways of, of, divine, of uh, dealing with those crises should be very informative for scientists to take into account. So you've nicely put together all kinds of, of, div of scientific evidence on how to face it. But um, I think this is, a, this is a huge opportunity for engagement with patient groups and see how they, how they do proceed in, in their endeavors to establish knowledge for themselves that works out in the, yeah. and dealing with complexity and uncertainty, which they have lots of unknown unknowns and they try and they have multiple ways of, 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 of delivering knowledge. So, first of all, much of appreciation for your, for your contribution and, uh, well, I'd love to work with you. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank thank you. To follow. Thank you very much for that comment. And uh, yes, absolutely, the voices of patient groups. I think um, where pragmatism has been applied more than in healthcare has been in, in climate and environmental science, where you've got um, citizen activists and protesters, you know, Greta Thunberg and her people, all that kind of thing. And the question of the extent to which um, these groups should be equal partners in the scientific and wider debates and i think to some extent in climate science the voice of citizens the voice of the layperson has become so kind of loud uh, and difficult to ignore that science just doesn't happen without some kind of presence at the table now you may disagree about that, but the, in healthcare, we've got a, a kind of different thing happening. We've got a lot of lip service paid to patient involvement. You really must have a patient on your steering group. And you, if you're submitting a paper to the British Medical Journal, they have to say, well, how, how were patients involved and all that kind of thing. But they don't actually want an equal relationship. Um, they don't want a democratic relationship. And then when the patient groups in, say, long COVID, publish their stuff you say oh no that wasn't any good because you didn't do it right and you're not clever enough because you don't have the expertise and these discussions and debates go round and round um, and of course what I'm not saying is that any group of patients who've got an opinion on something can now just override a piece of scientific research that's not what I'm saying I'm saying we need to have dialogue around the table um, because only then will we work through these different framings and ask these complex questions and do the conjunctive theorizing that takes us forward and allows us to act. So yeah, patients, citizens, advocates, yes, totally. And I'm working with them, by the way. I'm, I'm working with the long COVID group. Charles <laughs> had a question, I think. Yeah, thanks. <coughs> so Trish, I um, so, as you know, we've done a lot of research on, on, on COVID decision making as well, and, and lots of the things that you're mentioning are I, I recognise. So, so, to give you one example, so we've been following decision making within the crisis uh, region in in Rotterdam with um, our mayor, who is now the the, uh, uh, the best mayor of the world, actually, elected. Uh, he was sort of you know, the decision maker. And we know that there was lots of knowledge on the table on those crisis decision making uh, 
groups in those countries that also showed, you know, the inequalities, the um, uh, the lack of attention for people in, you know, the deprived neighborhoods. Um, you know, people, also community workers, going out there and talking to those people and bringing back knowledge into the crisis yep. decision making. Well, interestingly, that was all ignored. It was all ignored. It yes, was all it ignored, was, and it was ignored in the so, UK. Yep. Yeah. And and so and I so I've, I've I, and there's lots of indie evaluations that we now see in in the Netherlands also so um, so we just had an evaluation by a safety board saying um, you know uh, long term care is was dramatic um, you know uh, the, there were all kinds of things and we already know that we already knew it actually in say April 2020 yes we did but we never acted on it yeah so. I strongly believe, you know, your call for, you know, more pluralism and, and those kinds of things. But how? The question: How? So, yeah. do we have actually? What is the momentum, or what is the what are the mechanisms that we can actually, you know, build on to change that? Because in the moment of crisis, you will have this, you know, top-down, very narrowly defined way of acting yeah. and decision making. So, can you can you? sort of illuminate us on yeah. how, to, how to do that. It's really interesting. Of course, I don't have a simple solution. It would be inappropriate. Um, I think you're right, Roland, that the, the evidence did kind of trickle through. That Chris Whitty in the UK, who is our chief medical officer, was talking about inequalities in around April, May, and certainly this was being talked about. But they didn't have the kind of numerical facts the certainty, and that stopped them acting. And so it's this combination of scientific caution that when you're developing a new drug, if you don't yet have certainty, it would be very, very foolish to start putting a patient on that drug because there may be some catastrophic effect. You may kill the patient until you've tested your drug rigorously in a randomized controlled trial. And so scientific the scientific mindset tends to say it's more ethical not to act until you've got certainty. And that's all very well, except when you've got an escalating global pandemic with a significant mortality rate. Now, I think the, the, the shift that is needed is the shift from waiting for certainty to acting under conditions of uncertainty. And so when the evidence comes around the table about, for example, intergenerational transmission of COVID within households and people continuing to go into work because the family depends on the income of that individual, um, et cetera, et cetera, and the kid goes to school and you know, granddad gets COVID and then the parent goes into work and transmits, we don't need to prove that. It sounds pretty good, doesn't it? It sounds like the sort of thing that is happening and we've got plenty of stories and all the stories are pointing in the same direction. So let's act. Let's act before we've proved it. Now, how we do that, this is not going to happen overnight. But I, as I, as I said, I am trying to infiltrate the editorial boards of journals. I'm trying to influence the panels who award research grants. Um, it's going to be a slow thing. We, we are seeing some movement. Mostly it's happening outside medicine because medicine is a particularly entrenched um, uh, sector. Um, but yeah, and, and standing up and talking to people like you guys, of course. But yeah, some of you knew this already, I know. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. You have a question from yours? Hi, interesting talk. I have a question. You were many times talking about precaution and the precautionary uh, principle mm -hmm. but how does that relate to risk taking in the context of uncertainty because if you don't know you might be taking risks that in yeah. hindsight are uh, have yeah. a bad result so what pragmatism would say is one of the things you need to do when you are deliberating on what to do, because pragmatism is all about what to do, you have to follow through two possible narratives. One is what are the potential consequences of acting and what are the potential consequences of not acting? And 
this did not happen in UK policymaking. They, they didn't say what would happen. Uh, for example, back in the masking um, situation, right back in March 2020, nobody followed through. What would be the worst case scenario of bringing in mask mandates in the UK very early? So when people would be cross and all the rest of it. Uh, there were some people saying, no, this could, be, this could be terrible because you could contaminate people through your mask. The mask became, I mean, we, we came up with this slogan, it's a piece of cloth, not a landmine. There were going to be all these masks that were going to spread things everywhere, and that's why we couldn't wear them. But apart from that kind of weird meme that, that took off a bit, Actually, most people didn't follow through, that nothing terrible was going to happen. They, they wouldn't be dreadful if people wore masks. It, they might have been wasting their time. Uh, they just didn't go there. And so I think this business about risk, it's about um, taking forward the, the possibilities. And you may not be able to assign a detailed uh, quantitative value to those. You, you might be able to say the worst case scenario is this, the best case scenario is this. Um, and now let's think, should we act or should we hold back? And those conversations were not happening. It sounds like they weren't happening in, in the Netherlands either. Uh, well, thank you, Chris. Other questions? Well, I had a question myself. So you, you, you drew a distinction between evidence-based medicine and complex system thinking. Uh, and I recognized sort of things from both camps. I consider myself to be an evidence-based medicine person, but then rather new style rather than the old school. So, and, and, and I thought uh, all the things you mentioned about uncertainty, in a sense, I would embrace. I consider that to be essential as to making evidence-based decisions. So, how do you sort of, uh, what are you trying to achieve? Are you really trying to sort of upgrade evidence-based medicine to sort of integrate more types of evidence? Because I think already a lot of hap is happening uh, in that area. Uh, um, I think you're right that it's very easy to caricature evidence-based medicine. I think a lot of people who... Um, would say I'm a soldier in the evidence-based medicine army, have a, quite a limited philosophical understanding. They kind of get the tick lists and they get the hierarchies and they, they like the kind of identifying with the we are best evidence, but they don't get the more subtle stuff. I think the EBM community has done an amazing job of uh, extending its reach in a lot of areas, it's improved its methodology, it's, uh, the Cochrane Collaboration, for example, has done um, really great work in building collaborations with patients, with, with um, policy makers and all that kind of thing. Nevertheless, there are a few really major things, like the Cochrane Review on the efficacy of masks rejected all evidence except randomized controlled trials. So on the one hand, there's this narrative, oh, no, we embrace all other kinds of evidence. And on the other hand, and there's the reality that the advice given to the World Health Organization based on a Cochrane review was spectacularly limited. Um, and I think fundamentally, I think EBM um, was a 20th century movement and we now need to kind of move beyond it. But because EBM is now so powerfully positioned within the WHO, within all the major medical journals, the only way through is by stealth, which is why I'm chatting up the editors of these various journals, saying, would you like some interesting, interesting new ideas? And what we're trying to do is rebrand these ideas in a way that evidence-based medicine says, oh, yeah, we thought of that. It's going to be, we're now going to be uh, more pluralist. But actually, EBM will never be pluralist, because philosophically, it stands for finding certain truths which are mostly quantitative and which are generalizable and transferable. For example, the efficacy okay. of dexamethasone. That's what EBM is. Okay, but well then I have a completely different understanding of, of evidence-based <laughs> medicine. I would say that the essence of evidence-based medicine would be or should be then about quantifying uncertainties, right? So uh, we have a famous colleague uh, uh, in health economics always said, well, if you want truth, 
you know, don't go into science. Go adopt a religion. Uh, so it, it, it's, it's, so how do you see that, you know? I think a lot of the work that we do, especially social science, is quantifying uncertainty. Yeah, these are known unknowns. EBM not is absolutely about known unknowns. They can't cope with the uncertainty. That's why they didn't look at them. Read the Jefferson Cochrane Review. It's extraordinary. They just said, we reject all that. We reject all that. We don't like it. Right? I mean, that's what they did. So, so I, I understand what you're saying. You're saying, no, no, EBM is much richer and all the rest of it. But look what, the way they act. Look what they did in the pandemic. Look at the damage they did. And then come back to me and say, no, EBM is, is really pluralist. It's really embracing everything. It's not. That's not what they did. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, but that's, but that's, but that's, but that's, that's practice. That, that's, pra that's, that's practice. I, I think we, we, need, we need to discuss this further. So I, I, I think, is there some questions from the audience still? <laughs> yes, there is a last question from. Thank you for a very inspiring talk in which uh, decision making and acting has quite a central place. If you allow me to step back from uh, decision making under crisis to more regular decision making mm. and reflecting on the fact that uh, which I liked a lot the context sport between all these institutions and interest uh, the Netherlands by some standards should be ideally equipped for that sport uh, by some standards we have we are the number one in the world of interest groups and, and and the polder model is quite famous, we can talk a lot about things. But if you look at the current consensus that in the Dutch healthcare system some things need to change to keep it sustainable in the future, we see, and that's very ironic, that a number of parties that could act or could decide, ranging from governments to the healthcare insurers to the uh, healthcare providers, are actually stepping back from taking action and deciding. And I wondered, listening to your talk, how would your, how would your story, inspiring story, translate to a situa situation where parties are actually stepping back from taking decisions and actions in a quite narrative uh, context sports that is daily happening in the Netherlands on the healthcare system? Um, obviously, I can't answer that unless I know more about the detail, but I think it is quite interesting that very, very often we now have inaction and it's partly because things are getting so complex um, the policy making arena now is hyper complex uh, which means that these simple designs like RCTs are just becoming less and less fit for purpose and let me repeat what I said right at the beginning is I owe my life to a randomized controlled trial I'm not opposed to them in their place but in terms of policy making, particularly under conditions of crisis, but even under normal conditions, we need a more pluralist approach. But we also need an approach in which people, uh, in which people and institutions are confident to act even when they're not certain. And that, I think, is where pragmatist philosophy might come in. Thank you. Uh, well, Trish, uh, thanks a lot for this really nice uh, presentation and all the questions you gave and the answers to the, to the nice questions. So, what we have now, we have parallel sessions. Some of them will be here, one of them. One is next door and the other one is located in a different building. Uh, you can join, uh, I think, a group uh, for those who don't know the way around campus. Just follow the others. Uh, but before... <laughs> But before we do that, uh, uh, let's give a warm hand for Trish.